Hello, D. Watkins here with Salon TV, and today I'm joined by former U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Julian Castro, to talk about his new book, An Unlikely Journey, Waking Up from My American Dream. How you doing? Doing great. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you so much for coming in. This is this isn't a, a great book. It's incredible. Um, your story of success in politics is truly inspiring. What made you write this book now? Uh, you know, I actually started working on the book uh, in early 2013. I kind of feel like a walking cliche yeah. <laughs> uh, because, uh, as some folks may know, uh, I'm seriously considering running for president in 2020. Um, and the thing that people do, right, is that there's a book out mm -hmm. before you run. Um, but I actually started working on it you know, more than five years ago, and I wanted to tell my family's story um, of our time here in the United States, starting with my grandmother, that, that I begin the book with, um, because you know, I hope that it's inspiring mm -hmm. uh, to a lot of other families, and I especially hope that it resonates with young people um, who uh, you know, sometimes wonder whether they can still achieve the American dream. Um, that's why, you know, uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about the subtitle, but right. waking up from my American dream. It's a strong, is it's a strong subtitle, but I do, I feel like um, running for president or not, we need more voices like yours in the world. The publishing industry, I've been in the publishing industry for about, I think I published my first book four years ago, and it's still extremely lopsided. It's a very white industry. Um, your story is, is different. You're, um, from what I've read, you don't really seem like, um, seems like as a kid you didn't grow up wanting to be a politician, you know, walking around the house with your little suit on. <laughs> yeah, like that. no, so, no. You know, what was the big shift for you? Um, for me, because I grew up in an active household. You know, my mother had been involved in the old Chicano movement. Mm -hmm. She was a Chicana activist. And she would drag my brother Joaquin and me to rallies and speeches. And, you know, she never was in politics. She didn't hold office, but she was around it. She was trying to make change. Um, so we grew up around it, but uh, when I was a teenager, I used to think that, uh, that, you know, for what? Like, I didn't see the point of it because my mom and her colleagues were coming kind of from an outsider's perspective, mm -hmm. and I didn't see the changes being made and the people being helped by political involvement that, that you know, I thought should happen. So you were thinking more strategy. Yeah, yeah so, but, I, you know, back then I thought that I was going to go into, um, you know, uh, marketing or advertising or something and um, I remember that my grandmother that I write about that I grew up with wanted me to be a chef right. when I grew up yeah. uh, but I just cook? Uh, not really man. <laughs> yes I think I failed her in that regard yeah. but yeah I did not I didn't what what to answer your question the shift for me happened when I went away from my home community in San Antonio mm -hmm. and it was I had grown up with my brother on the west side of San Antonio in the public schools there uh, you know, we got scholarships and financial aid to go to Stanford, and and when we got to Stanford, we had never been there before. We had been on a plane one time. Was it like culture shock? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was very different. Now, I was lucky because my twin brother, Joaquin, was there with me, mm -hmm. um, but it was the first time that I could see my community where I had grown up with an outsider's eyes, and what I saw was that compared to that Bay Area of California, you know, you had in San Antonio much lower income levels, mm -hmm. lower education levels. Uh, it seemed like a community that was less ready for the future. Um, I also saw some things that I liked. You know, in San Antonio, there's still a sense of community. Like the way I like to say it is, if two people pass each other on the street downtown, they still look each other in the eye. Like there's still a sense of connection. But the shift was, how can we create more opportunity for folks where I came from. Mm. Like, I, I got a kind of chip on my shoulder about San Antonio and making sure that more people could succeed. You're part of that last generation of people who feel like they can dedicate their lives to public service and see change. And I say that because so many millennials don't want to run for office. They sit at home on election day. They feel like their systems have, have failed them. What do, you, what do you say to them, or how do you get them to, to see the world the way you see it? Well, you know, I can, I can empathize and understand some of that because uh, you know, I write in the book that my mother was part of a third party mm. that at the time was saying, you know, neither the Republican Party nor the Democratic Party is, is doing nearly enough for the Hispanic community 
down there in Texas. And so they formed their own party and you know, ran candidates and so forth. And so I can understand the idea that people get frustrated with our, our partisan system and all of the back and forth. I would just say that the common denominator no matter what your political beliefs are, mm -hmm. is participation. Mm. That in our system, the only way that you're going to make a real difference is if you make your voice heard. And you make your voice heard through your vote. You can't complain if you're not doing anything. Yeah, you, you know, use, I mean, and I mean, things aren't going to change. You know, because I voted. And, you know, our current president, he said he was going to make America great again, and I just don't see it. I've yeah, no, looking, I agree. I, I have well, glasses on. I still, <laughs> I still can't see it. Well, it's, it's amazing that, 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 you know, a lot of people feel uh, under siege these days, mm -hmm. a lot of communities, and, you know, it's very divisive and picking and choosing who gets opportunity and who doesn't. But, but yeah, I, I, I believe, though, and my hope is that in, uh, in a few weeks on November 6th, that we're going to see a lot more young people hopefully go to the polls. So take us to that image um, of that Trump protest at the border that you write about in the book. Did it remind you of some of the rallies that your mom took you to as a kid, or, or just to put us put us in that moment? Well, I uh, I went on Father's Day. I write at the very beginning of the book uh, to McAllen, Texas, which is on the border, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a group of activists that were protesting, holding a rally outside of what's known as the Ursula Processing Center, which is basically where families go and they are physically separated. Uh, wow. Families that have been apprehended at the border and then they're sent off from there. So that's you know why they call it processing. Um, and for me, yeah, it reminded me of, of when I was younger and some of what my mom used to do, but more than anything else, it just drove home the point. There, there we were on Father's Day when you're celebrating family mm -hmm. and the importance of parents and here we were with the American government forcibly taking away children from their parents. Uh, you know, not only how un-American, but how inhumane uh, what Donald Trump did there through his policy uh, was. And, um, you know, it heartened me that there were a lot of folks of different backgrounds who had come in from different places to rally, to, to oppose the policy and to bring attention mm -hmm. to it. Um, you know, but I think we need a lot more of that, and we need people to show up at the ballot box to change the leaders that we have in office. So waking up from your American dream, what does the American dream mean to you? To me, it means um, the ability to be successful as you define that. You know, classically, as you know, the American mm -hmm. dream um, a lot of times meant something material, mm -hmm. right? Getting the house, getting the car. Um, but, you know, for my grandmother, for instance, I write in the book, you know, she got pulled out of elementary school, and so she never finished elementary school. She worked as a maid, a cook, and a babysitter. She never owned a car. She never owned a house. She didn't even have a bank account. But at the end of her life, I feel, I believe she felt like she was successful because she saw the only child that she had, my mom, graduate from high school and then go on to college. And one of the last things that she saw mm -hmm. was um, or that I told her was that I had gotten into Harvard Law School. You know, she, we were there at Stanford and we were getting ready to go to law school and so she knew that she had worked hard and successfully made sure that her daughter could have more opportunity in the country and that, um, that we could. And so I believe that she lived her own American dream. And if we're like, you know, going to just look at this, um, so many people, so many young people in America feel like the dreams are not obtainable. How do we how do we keep it alive? How do we keep it? Well, uh, I think we're going through a time right now where we have to do a gut check on who we are, mm -hmm. whether it's with this family separation issue or, you know, wanting to ban Muslims from traveling into this country or uh, a whole bunch of other draconian policies. Yeah, we need to summon a common sense of national uh, identity and a sense of purpose. Um, the other way that we do it is that we make sure that we elect people who believe in opportunity for everybody. Because that's been the story of our country. Our country has some, you know, terrible, um, you know, uh, um, had some terrible setbacks, mm -hmm. right? We think about slavery. Uh, we think about the Jim Crow era. Uh, we think about the fact that 
women didn't even have the right to vote or to own property. And the story of the country has been a determined group of people who, who were fighting to expand rights and opportunities. The moment that we're at right now is whether that expansion, that forward progress will continue or will it give way to this darker vision that our leadership in Washington has of scaling that back. Yeah, it's like you fight and you fight and you fight and you fight and then someone comes along and they try to erase it. Like even you you mentioned how um, affirmative action may have helped you with Stanford and how, you know, however it has a lawsuit and they're trying to stop that. Yeah, no, I talked about that. Um, yeah, I saw the, the trial just started mm -hmm. this week and there's, there's no question that in our country there have been policies and investments that have been made along the way and rights that have been gained because of hard-fought struggles. And my message to this new generation is that you have a role to play in continuing that forward progress. I mean, when we think about those children that are sitting there in those detention centers or we think about um, all of the young people who are going to our public schools who are not getting anywhere near the education that they should get because we have failed them in a lot of the public schools. I mean, I went to the public schools, but I saw a lot of students that were mm -hmm. not able to avail themselves of the same opportunity that my brother and I were able to. Um, there's still a tremendous amount of work to be done. And so my message for, for young people is, um, don't throw up your hands, but get into the fight. You know, participate. And there's multiple ways to participate. Like, you don't just have I mean, get into politics, but you can do other things too, right? Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, I mean, most folks, yeah, and like, and, most you know. folks won't get into politics, right? But yeah, teachers, lawyers, the way that I think about it is, in order to make progress, you need people working for that everywhere. You know, and my mother and her generation, and of course, still today, throughout the generations, you have people that are marching, that are mm -hmm. protesting on the streets. Um, you have elected officials now. Um, more from different backgrounds that are working in city halls or state legislatures or in the halls of Congress fighting to improve things. You have people in corporate boardrooms right. that are trying to get companies to do the right thing, to be everybody. more responsible. Yeah. So whatever your profession is or however you do that, whether it's through you know, a, a church or a neighborhood association or the PTA, work to, to make sure that you help others progress. So you were the first Latino to give a keynote at the DNC. What does it first mean for your community? Um, well, for me, that moment was, uh, first of all, it was <laughs> nerve-wracking, <Yeah>. right? <laughs> I remember you look cool, though. It looked like you did it a thousand <laughs> yeah, times. No, right? and, you know, and President Obama and I had a chance, <laughs> maybe for like three or four minutes, once to talk about uh, you know, my experience speaking and, and his experience speaking. And I told the president, you know, like 30 seconds into the speech, I thought I was going to pass out. Man. Yeah, really? <laughs> you know? Yeah. You yeah, look yeah. so cool. I know, like, I it know. seemed well, like, you know. Like, you know, sometimes you just got to <laughs> go with it. But I was just glad there was something to lean on. Um, but in terms of being the first, I think uh, you know, my brother Joaquin and I are, are very aware that we're fortunate to have gotten to the places that we've gotten to. Mm -hmm. And then also that not a lot of people who look like us have had those kind of opportunities. And so we do feel a responsibility, you know, of course, to, to represent everybody, because if you're in an office, you have to represent everybody, but also that, that there's a special meaning um, for, uh, especially the Latino community, because they haven't had that many folks mm -hmm. be able to, to go to those places. And we've tried to spend time going back into schools, mm -hmm. um, talking to folks, encouraging young people to pursue their dreams. And as Secretary of HUD, what do you feel like your biggest accomplishments were? Uh, I would say the, the two biggest accomplishments that I'm proudest of, number one, we made the biggest progress on fair housing mm -hmm. uh, that had been made uh, probably since the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Uh, the Fair Housing ha Act of 1968 said that the Secretary of HUD had the obligation to affirmatively further fair housing. Mm -hmm. But that had never been put into a rule. It hadn't been defined. Um, what we did in 2015 was that we said to uh, communities that are receiving HUD money, taxpayer mm -hmm. money, that you need to get more serious about equal housing opportunity in your jurisdiction. And we saw it as a way to increase opportunity, especially for people of color, right. uh, and to decrease segregation in our nation. Which America's so rural. How do you get how do you get people on a ranch to sign on to that? 
Uh, well, I mean, you know, it, it, you're right that it's more challenging in some places than others, but right. also, right, like if, if you have some communities out there um, that are rural, they, they each have their own different sort of dynamics and concerns. You know, what we're dealing with in a city like San Francisco or my hometown of San Antonio or D.C. or here in New York is different from mm -hmm. what you would deal with in rural Ohio or some place like that. I visited rural Wisconsin when I was HUD secretary. And, and so there's, of course, an allowance for that. We, we wanted those communities to forge their plan, um, but we wanted them to, to do it. And did you leave some notes for Ben Carson? <laughs> <laughs> I think we left some binders that uh, I don't know how much they've been followed, man. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, so you, 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 you're considering running for president. Like, I am. You know, what is the, like, what are you going to run on? Well, uh, if I decide to run, if America's yeah, still here, <laughs> by the yeah. time you decide hopefully to run. it'll still be here I hope, I hope, after I hope, November. I hope we'll be here. <laughs> but you know, I went into politics because I felt very blessed with opportunity mm -hmm. in my life, and I wanted to make sure that other people could have that same kind of opportunity. And no matter the office that I was in, I've tried. I've worked like crazy to use the levers of that office mm -hmm. to spark greater opportunity for people. Uh, if I run for president, it's because I have a very strong vision for the country. And that vision begins with a blueprint for 21st century opportunity. Because we know that what worked yesterday is not what's going to work tomorrow. People need more uh, education and skills than ever before to compete in the job marketplace. Uh, we also, I think, need to invest in things like universal health care, universal pre-K, making sure that somebody can get a good college education or mm -hmm. at least cert certification so that they can get gainful employment. Like, it, the 21st century just requires more than it used to. Right. And if I run, I'll sketch out my vision for the future. So Jack made Bobby attorney general. What role would your brother play in the administration? <laughs> He'd be my like my water boy, yeah. like holding the water. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I, <laughs> I, you know, I write in the book about how competitive Joaquin and I were yeah. when we were kids. Like he took the Dallas Cowboys, the Texas team, early, and so I had to take another team, and I what took the think? Eagles. Yeah, took the Eagles, yeah. yeah. And Randall Cunningham was my favorite quarterback. But on the days now, when Randall they would, was amazing, amazing. Yeah, he Randall was a great. Amazing. If he He's were in the league today, like yeah, yeah, like there's never been anybody quite like him, you know. Um, but on Sundays when the Eagles and the Cowboys would play, like you didn't want to be in our house. But today, one of the one of the neat things about growing up has been like just like your relationship with your parents evolves. Mm -hmm. um, that our relationship has gone from one that was very competitive to one that's very collaborative, and so. Yeah, if I decide to run, I expect that my brother will be my number one advisor and right-hand right -hand guy. So in preparation for this, I just want to throw some terms out, and I want you to just give, like, say the first thing that comes to mind. All right, economy. Uh, could do better. Student loan debt. Uh, we need to erase it. MAGA hats. <laughs> Interesting, <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, wish there were, uh, I wish there were less of them. Police okay. reform. We need to do it. Race relations. Uh, always a work in progress. So one thing I want to say, or one thing I just want to touch on is um, with all of these floating things going around, um, you get the nomination and, and you run, or you decide not to run, right? What is, what is the best thing that you can do? If you don't run, or if you do run, and you know for whatever reason you don't get the nomination, how do you contribute to making this whole thing better? Because we're like in a really, really weird place right now, and I hate to keep going back to people who are uninspired, but we need, like you know, we need voices like yours, we need voices like Obama. We we need so like what is what is the biggest contribution that that you can make? Well, uh, I mean, part of what I've been doing for the last year and a half, right? I was a visiting fellow. I was lecturing at the LBJ School at UT, mm -hmm. trying to impart whatever wisdom I have on right. the younger generation. I've gone involved uh, supporting candidates through an effort called Opportunity First, supporting young progressive Democrats that are running so that we elect a good bench of people uh, at every level that care about their communities, that are working for um, progressive policies. Uh, I also am doing things like uh, on the board of Voto Latino mm -hmm. to try and make sure that more of the Latino community is registered to vote and turns out to vote. 
uh, and then just using my voice right. uh, on issues like immigration and this activism going down to the border. I also went to that Tornillo uh, tent city near El Paso. I'll continue to do that. Um, you know what's weird is that, is that I, I haven't felt, uh, after I've left public office, I haven't missed it as mm -hmm. much as I thought that I would. Right. <laughs> well, hopefully you'll, you'll get back yeah. in soon. Tell everyone where they can get the book. Uh, they can get the book, An Unlikely Journey, uh, online or at bookstores now. It came out yesterday. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.